is this? Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, what wondrous love is this? Oh, my soul, what wondrous love is this? That caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. For my soul to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, sinking down, when sinking down beneath God's righteous frown. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. enjoy, uh, well, I enjoy all of it. I just tell you, I enjoy all of it. When I was in school, I was a little bit backwards. You know, I did. I went to, I went to school, and uh, it's it's been covered up, and about got scraped off through the years. But I did go to school, and they required that we go to an opera, and uh, in fact, they required we go to several of them. And I was kind of, you know. Well, right out of where I was from, I just opera wasn't in my vocabulary. But I went and and we went to Elijah. Y'all, y'all heard that? Well, no, I forgot who wrote that. Some 
some fellow wrote that, you know, in a nightmare type situation. But he got he wrote it. And uh boy they got to singing that thing. And man, I kinda got caught up in it. And I got looking for chariots around there after a little while, you know. I I I've got to where my my I've broadened my my appreciation for this. Now I ain't got into that Christian rock yet. But I'll tell you, thank God for those old songs that just help you. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Mikey, you ready to sing? Come on here and sing. Hallelujah. Brother, it's a, it's a joy to have little Mikey with us. Thank God. He's been a blessing around here for a number of years. Brother Mikey, you don't have to stand behind the pulpit, but you can if you need to. Okay. Uh, got him. <laughs> Good to be here tonight. They was asked me earlier if I wanted to do this uh, with, with music or without, and I said I without because I don't have any with me. Uh, the group that I sing with in Tennessee, we've been back together a little over a year now. We traveled for about nine or ten years full time. We finally got back together, but during this COVID thing we go, we haven't sung since May. I haven't got to practice maybe one or two times since May. So if I'm a little rusty tonight, forgive me. But I do this for the glory of God, not for me. God gave me a talent to use, and I want to use it for Him and Him only. I've been offered many times to go out country, but I won't, won't do it because I know where my work is for. It's for the Lord. And I want my talents to be for Him. Whether it is singing, or whether it's preaching, it's all for Him. I'm gonna, every time I'm up here, I usually do this song, but this is my, my song. And it's called Once a Man Who Gave His Life for Us and Died on an Old Rugged Cross for me. If there wouldn't have been anybody else that He died for but me, it was worth it all. Once a man whom we know as the Son of God hung upon a cruel tree, he suffered pain as a mortal man. He took my place. He did it all for me. He did it all for me. Each drop of blood He shed for even me. When the Savior Cried, bowed his head, and he died. Oh, praise the Lord, he did it all for me. When I step just inside of those gates, those gates of pearl, and my master's face I'm going to see. I will gladly kneel at his nail scar 
heart beat. Oh, praise the Lord, he did it all for me. He did it all for me. Each drop of blood he shed for even me. When the Savior cried, bowed his head, and he died. Oh, praise the Lord, he did it all for me. When the Savior cried, Thank you, Brother Mike. Thank you, Sister Cindy. I, I wish everybody added to the church like these folks do. I thank the God. Thank the Lord for y'all. Thank God. All right, brother, come and preach for us. Pastor of the River of Life Baptist Church. <laughs> the, Flats, Flats, the cultural center of the universe. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think I shared with you a few years ago, back in the 80s, uh, before I was pastoring, I, I know I don't know if this ever happened to you other preachers, I guess it does, but sometimes you get in a locale and you spend a lot of time there. And one summer, me and my, or one spring, me and Mikey got over there in Wilkes County, North Carolina, and then we went over to Statesville, and then we went over at something, Swamp Creek or somewhere, and uh, we went to West Jefferson and uh, Boone, and so one night we were, we got in the car, and he said, you know what people's calling me and you over here? I was back in the 80s, and I said, no. He said, they're calling us Jake and the Fat Man, and uh, I said, I'll tell you right now, if anybody calls you Fat Man, you let me know, and I'll put a stop to that. I ain't going to have you talked about, but I am so glad to have here, be here, and glad to have Mike with me. Mike has been a friend. Uh, we've been traveling, I said 35 years. It's been more like 40 years, and uh I praise God for him. Uh, last night, I really, it, it done me good to see old Larry loosen up and talk about being afraid one time. That really thrilled me to death. And um, so I got to thinking about one time that I was afraid. And uh, I don't know how y'all y'all was raised or what, back in my day, we had people that told ghost stories. And my daddy was the most renowned ghost story. And people come to our house on Friday and Saturday night and tell ghost stories. I went to bed a many a night, wringing wet with sweat with the covers pulled right here. Anybody ever do that besides me? Apparently the ghost can't get you if the covers is here. And if he gets bad enough, you can just pull the cover on over the top. But I never wanted my daddy to know I was afraid. And he come in from work one day and the boys had asked me to camp with them on McLaughlin Hill. And it's up over the top of Austin Springs. You can see everything from there. And, and uh, daddy, mama said, I can't let you go till your daddy gets home from work. Make sure it's all right. You got all your chores done. And daddy rolled up about six o'clock and it's pitch dark. It was in the winter time. My buddies was up there. And he said, yeah, you can camp if you got everything done. He said, you ain't scared, are you? No. <laughs> no, no, no. I ain't as scared. And he gave me a big old pry bar. I don't know if you've ever seen him. Had a handle on it like a screwdriver and about that long. He said, if anybody tries to stop and boogie you up or anything, you just brain them with that and go on. Well, on the way down there, I knew I had to go by the horse farm of Banners where they raised them race horses. And um, uh, so uh, Daddy and them had told him stories about that fella riding a horse a hole in his head. Y'all ever heard that? Well, before I ever got to school, I done heard that story. 
And I had that thing, I was walking down through there and I was whistling, yeah, I'm not a bit of scrape. Something come out here and get some of this fuel on it. And back in those days when it was cloudy and overcast, there wasn't no street lights, wasn't no house lights. When I say dark, I mean D-A-R-K, like you said, dark. And I thought, well, I'll get on the other side of the road in case the car comes around that blind curve. What I did not know that one of them big thoroughbred horses is right down there next to the spring uh, sucking water when I come through there. And just as I got by there, so help me, he went, <laughs> and I said, Whoo! and I throwed that thing up in the air like a torch and went to running. Well, they was a creek. He had nowhere to run but right along beside of me. And we was making step by step of me screaming every breath. And we run up there, and honestly, I, I figured out what it was. You ever feel like bees were stinging you in the head? I mean, I about went out. And so my legs were shaking, and I, I waited, and I walked on up McLaughlin Hill, and there was all my buddies standing up there looking and said, man, there's something bad going on down there. I said, what? He said, there's a woman screaming down there. I said, you you hear up here? Did you hear? I said, I didn't hear nothing. I really did You know, I was 30 year old before I told them boys, that was me screaming like a little girl down there. And... Uh, Oh, my goodness. I ain't afraid of nothing as long as it's alive. Amen. <laughs> if you would, stand in honor of the reading of God's word. It's been a privilege and a blessing to be here. Uh, we got the best baskets I've ever got in my life, and I appreciate your honorariums. I appreciate the fellowship. The meals have been absolutely wonderful. The breakfast the other morning, the only thing better than the food was the fellowship. It was just an awesome, awesome time, and I appreciate it. It's a blessing to me to get to know these fellows even better and spend time, and uh, guys that I've looked up to for many years to be on the same stage with them. I don't take that for granted, and uh, I, I feel like the least of them, but I'm thankful. God, that I get to run around with them a little bit. Amen? And so um, I want you to look at Acts chapter number uh, 9, verse number 23. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, and their laying a weight was known to, at Saul of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by the night and led him down the wall of the basket. Father, you know what's on our heart. I believe it's of you. I ask you, God, there'd be no barrier between speaker and here. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to omit anything I need to omit and to add those things you say to preach. Lord, help us not chase too many rabbits tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. My title tonight, if I could, is I got this idea from Brother Jack. I guess it was last night. And uh, Brother Jack was talking about our final basket. And you're right, Jack. I went and looked it up. And the French word and the Latin word that was Greek uh, of basket, uh, the coffin was originally called a basket. Now, I could not find about the tr treasure chest, and that's fine if it is. I just couldn't. I, I had to, had my little uh, iPad, and I don't do as well researching with this as I do my big computer. But um, as I was looking at that, my question tonight is not, will you be in a coffin? You will one way or other, a coffin or urn or whatever you do. But my question is, where will you be after you're put in your last basket? Where will you be when this body is laid in your last basket? And it's a question that all of us are going to have to live with. Man is the only creature I know of that God created that knows he's going to die, and we do everything in our power to keep from it. I've been in the funeral business for years, and we dress up people to make them look good. We fix caskets. We get the best clothes. Uh, we do everything. But I'm telling you, back in the embalming room, and I don't want to scare no kids or nothing, but back in the embalming room, the death you see back there is not the death that we present out to the public. The, the, the death that you pick up at the coroner's office or the death you pick up at autopsy is not the death that you see there. Death is cold and ashen. And I'm talking about the the body. Now I'm not talking about the spirit. Please hear, please hear me out. Darwin talked about the origin of the species and tonight I'd like to talk to you just for a few minutes if I could about the beginning of the, uh, the end of the species. Where are we going to go? Where will you be five minutes after you die? Many years ago I was in a Bible conference and Brother Adrian Rogers was there and I went up to him after the service and I said Brother Adrian I heard you preach a message years ago and I don't want to do it verbatim but there's a couple of thoughts you had and I 
I just like you to know I'm going to preach you. He said, son, if my bullet will shoot your gun, shoot it. Just leave my gun along, if you will. And I said, all right, so I will attempt to do that. Five minutes after I die, where will you be? Five minutes after I have three little old points, little homely illustrations, and I hope that it will get, uh, get your attention. In Luke chapter number 16, verse 19, we hear a story that everybody in this building is aware of. And, uh, and, and we have, may have different opinions on how you get there, what happens, but I want you to look at this. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was, and I know it's Jubilee, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desired to be fed from the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sore. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. As I talked about this message and looked at this message, Jack, I'm not guilty of not trying to get a text to go with a basket, but it did in fact enter into my mind when Jack was talking. Now I'm going to be as frank as I know how. I don't have a lot of original thoughts. I don't know how the preachers get theirs, but I like to look at the book, get a thought, and if I hear a thought, you say, but don't you take a lot of notes when you come to Jubilee. I can preach about all year, the rest of the year on those notes until I get back up here again. Not really. At church, I do a little more expositional, um, expository preaching, and uh, I, I, I teach and preach through books, but I love coming up here, and I want to read you a little poem that a lady by the name of Mary Stillen wrote, and I hope that you'll listen closely. Loved ones will weep over my silent face. Dear ones will clasp me in sad embrace. Shadows and darkness will fill this place. Five minutes after I die. Faces of sorrow I will not see. Voices that murmur, they'll never reach me. But where, oh where, will my soul be? Five minutes after I die. Here I've rested and roved and ranged. Here I've cherished and grown estranged. There, oh there, when I will be changed, where will I be? Five minutes after I die. Not to repair the good that I lack. Fixed to the goal of my chosen track. No room to repent. No turning back. Five minutes after I die. Now I want to look at three little things and I'll get out of Gary's way and let him bring the closing message. The contrast in their lives, the contrast in their death, and the contrast in their eternity. The contrast in their lives, the contrast in their death, and the contrast in their eternity. Let's look at the contrast in their lives. But before doing, I'll tell you a little story. And I think somebody told it up here years ago, I do believe, but a rich uh, merchant man in Baghdad sent his servant to town to buy some linen and some things there and he went into the marketplace and he kept seeing this hooded figure following him and one time when he got down a little alley he turned around and bumped and there was death looking him eye to eye. It terrified him. It scared him to death and he, he rode the, the horses and the wagon as fast as he could back to his master in Baghdad and said Master, while I was in Baghdad I saw death. And he said, no, yeah. He said, I'm telling you, I saw death and it terrified me. He said, get on the best horse I've got. If you'll ride all day, ride all night, you can be in Samara, which is about 71 miles away. You can be Samara tomorrow and let this thing pass. And so the longer the, the, the man thought about it, the more aggravated he became. And so he went down to the market. And he went to the market and he looked around and he seen that hooded figure. And he got off to the side and he said, are you death? And death turned around those steel clothes like cold eyes and said, I am. He said, why did you terrify my servant? He said, I didn't mean to terrify him, but I was shocked to see him. He said, why? He said, our appointment's not till tomorrow night in Samara. Tomorrow night in Samara, there is a, it's appointed unto man to death and it's gonna happen, guys. I want you to know, it ain't a question if, it's when. Can somebody say amen? We look at the contrast in their lives. Life's not always fair. I, I really, I'm put off sometimes and, and I know there's a lot of people, they, they, they've made their own bed and sleep in it, but under God, it bothers me when Christians are always looking down their condescending nose at somebody's hopeless or homeless and hungry and and. and 
disease or whatever, but for the grace of God, there go you, there go you. And I just am grateful that God's letting me to be here today and not sleeping under a bridge in Roanoke, Virginia or Washington, D.C. That ought to make you long be able to shout the victory. I had two grandfathers. One of them was a Baptist preacher. The other one was a Pentecostal. My grandpa was a Pentecostal preacher. was raised on a farm, and he always loved to farm. And when he was just a young man, he bought a farm that we were all raised on. And my sister still lives on the home place. He bought it in 1931. My grandpa was never rich, but we never wanted for anything because we had hogs and we had cattle. And I remember, you remember St. John's Mill? We went down to St. John's Mill and Daddy said, I need some more feed for my hogs. He said, my goodness, how many hogs you got? Daddy said, I've just got two of them. He said, don't they eat anything but feed? He said, don't you feed them leftovers? He said, hoss leftovers in my house and starve a gray squirrel. He said, we don't throw away nothing but the grunt in our house. Amen? <laughs> But my grandpa White was raised in town. He was uneducated, never was able to read anything in the world but a Bible, and he could read it so well. But grandpa had one bad thing right after one. He raised six young'uns, and he, they lived in abject poverty. My mother ought never till the day she died, you boys was there, when I said for the first time in my life, her life, my mama understands grace today now she's dead. Mama never felt good enough, smart enough, pretty enough, and she was beautiful. And, uh, but, but she was raised in that abject poverty, and people looked down their nose at her for many, many years, and mother never felt like she was good as other people. My grandpa got a job finally good in Morganton, North Carolina. And he was working over there for Henry Don Furniture and he was making good money for the first time in his life living in a little company house over there. And he was said, he told dad, he said, Raymond, if I can work five more years, he said, God's gonna bless, I'll have me some money saved up and be able to get me a little house for me and Bess to retire in. He had a massive heart attack and was never able to work again. And, and I'm gonna tell you, my grandpa Humphrey, of all people would always commend and encourage my grandpa White. They were in-laws and when he'd get a change he would never help him uh, to embarrass him but he'd give my daddy a little piece of money and said help your father-in-law there. I'm telling you what did you learn from that? I learned and God blesses us Jack it's so we can bless others. He didn't bless us so we could hoard and hoard and hoard and commute and just taking everything. Life sometimes is not always fair. I don't know why people's different lots in life. Somebody said, did you have white privilege? Yes, I did. My privilege started at about 5.30 every morning. <laughs> and my daddy got my privilege rear end out of bed and he'd put a number 10 boot to it, Brogan, if I didn't work. But I'll tell you, I did have some opportunities and I want to share those with you. When I got ready to build a house, my granddaddy had a farm and he financed me a lot to build my house where I lived for years. And when I went to borrow money to build a house, he gave me a clear deed for that house. So in that, I, I was blessed by my grandpa's good credit and those things. But I'm telling you guys, life is hard for some people. Can you say amen? But look at the contrast in their life. Verse number 19 and 20, the rich man fared sumptuously and the beggar named Lazarus was laid out of his gate. Some people say this is parabolic, and if that's what you believe, that's fine. I don't, because he called him Lazarus, called him by name. Now, it's got some things like parables, but I believe this story actually happened. Here's a man that was, uh, wasn't able to work. He was got all kinds of maladies and sickness and troubles and trials, and as I was reading this, I happened to think of a verse of scripture in 1 Corinthians 4 and 7. For who maketh thee different? from another and what hast thou that thou did not receive I heard Jack say the other night you say well I've worked hard guys I've seen people Jack work hard their whole life and it seemed like every way they turned there was trouble uh, and then others are blessed beyond measure God kind of decides how he doles out all of these things and I'm indeed grateful for them First Timothy 6 and 7 said for we brought nothing into this world and it's for certain we will carry nothing out amen 
Amen. There was a contrast in their life. Secondly, there was a contrast in their deaths. There was a contrast in their deaths. Uh, the Bible tells me that uh, in verse number 22, he said, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried to the angels of Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and he was buried and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. There is a difference in how a Christian dies and how a sinner dies. I said, there is a big difference. I've seen them both. I was a chaplain for the Johnson City Police Department for years, and I want to tell you, I don't know what the other chaplains experienced, but I can tell you this from the bottom of my heart. When I went through a, a drug overdose or a suicide or a murder or something like that, there was a completely different spirit than when I went some godly person had died. It was just different, even though they were dead and gone. Uh, it was different. I remember my mother died she was trying to get out of the bed and to see Jesus. And then I told Gary one of the most beautiful things she'd done. My daddy wore the ugliest uh, baby blue powder blue suit with white shoes when he married Mama in 1953. I mean, and Mama said, your daddy was slick. <laughs> I don't know, slicks, cool, sexy, definitely, I don't know. But my mama thought daddy with white shoes and a powder blue suit was, and I quote, slick. <laughs> and so my mama on her deathbed, she's laying there and she started grinning from ear to ear. Santa said, mama, what is it? She said, Lord, look Kurt Raymond in that suit. <laughs> Lord, what a handsome young man. Well, he's slick. And I got to thinking, uh, uh, see, she didn't say, there's your poor old daddy broken down with disease. She said, there's your daddy, a young man. Hey, I believe she's seen him as he is now, about 33 years old, I believe. And I thank God for that. Mama tried to get up to see Jesus, and she's seen all those things. Oh, but there's a contrast. Yeah. Lazarus died and in heaven he uplifted his eyes, but the rich man not so. He had everything here. We have funerals sometimes. Greg over there, your buddy worked with me for years. And honestly, it is unbelievable the money that people spend on death. We, we buried somebody the other day in a $15,000 casket and a $14,000 fault. I mean, I can't imagine that. And all these people's coming and, and going in. All anybody could say was he was a good businessman. All anybody could say was he's a good Jason. See, all anybody can say is a smart dresser. Nobody can say he was with Jesus. <laughs> I've had funerals before, and you boys have, and you have, of somebody that you, as far as you know, had absolutely no hope. All you can do is preach Jesus. All you can do is talk to the living. But there's a difference. There's a contrast in the death of the righteous and the death of the sinner. I had a boy in my church, and I guess this has been recorded, but I asked Jack if I could tell it seven or eight years ago. He said, Donnie, if God will use it, tell it. I'm not going to tell Jack's last name. You know who I'm talking about. But several years ago, I met this preacher from West Virginia. Matter of fact, I'll tell you who he is, Rick. He's the guy we eat with up there at night. You come up White Sulphur Springs, and we were preaching revival up there. It's a boy that come down from St. Anne's, West Virginia. It was him. And for a time, he lived in Tennessee, and his daddy uh, frequented the VA. His daddy was without a doubt the cold hardest man I've ever been around. I've been around some rough characters. I spent a night or two in the Gray Bar Hotel. I don't know if y'all ever been there or not, but the lock's on the outside of the door, and you have to hold it and look out like this right here. Uh, somebody say amen right there, amen right there. And so this old guy, uh, he, he was wicked. I mean, forever wicked. And my buddy Jack wrecked his motorcycle, you remember that, and broke his jaw and something else, and I went over there to see him, and I said, how are you? And they hadn't put it, wired him, and he said, I've got all my x-rays done. And listen this, brother. At this time, this brother was 40-something-year-old, and he looked at me, and I said, is everything all right? And he went to crying. I mean, just went to crying. This old boy don't cry. I wouldn't get out of electric chair to fight him in a fire fight. And this old boy's tough. West Virginia coal mine cut your head off and spit in your neck tough. And he looked at me, lips trembling, and he said, they found out my collarbone's been broken seven times, Brother Donnie. 
I said, what caused it, Jack? He said, my daddy had grabbed my shirt and slammed me against that log house and said, I've heard it pop and break in there before and call me every name under the sun. It's his stepdaddy. And he said, you look like your blankety blank daddy and slam him up against that wall. And Jack come to me one day and he said, I'm writing a letter to daddy. Old Jack wrote a letter and I never seen so many grammatical errors, but that ain't what mattered. He said, Daddy, it's been hard all these years, but I want you to know I forgive you. And Daddy, I'd like to see you be saved. He said, Daddy, I, I forgive you. And his daddy tore it up and threw it in the fire. I went to see him to Veterans Administration and he would not look at me. I said, can I pray? He said, you can do whatever you want to, hoss. And I begin to pray, and I don't know if you preachers ever had, it's like sticking your head in a barrel and praying. They wasn't a drop of Holy Ghost. This thing had done been decided, amen? And so uh, anyway, that one Friday night, I took my wife out to dinner. And my phone rang, and it was Jack, and he said, Don, I'm in West Virginia. My oldest brother's up here, my other two brothers in Gatlinburg. Daddy's a dying, and mama's there by herself. How many knows I went for mama? Yeah. Amen. amen? I didn't go there for daddy, and I went for Jack. And I went over to Gary, and I'll tell you where they lived. You go right there to Bristol, the racetrack, turn right like you're going out to, to interstate batteries, and that first right, them little government apartments right there. And I went in there, and my wife went with me, and I said, uh, ma'am, Jack's called me, and she said, your hospice said he's dying. I'm talking about things that contrast in their death. I, I'm talking about my mom and my daddy, your friends and loved ones, seeing things, but I'm telling you, they ain't the only one that sees things. He had a hospital bed and I was standing at the bottom of it. It's God is my witness everywhere I moved. His eyes followed me. Demonic, hellish eyes. I went over and she said, you want a bottle of water? I went over to get a bottle of water. And he cut them eyes and watched me all the way over. And we were all standing around about that time the youngest boy's preacher come. And that pastor was probably in his early 30s, green as a gourd, and from a little church up there in Bristol, and he got on the other side. And uh, uh, the lady, I come to her, saying her name, said, Pastor Donnie, would you pray that he wouldn't suffer anymore and God take him on? I thought, Lord, 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 suffer no more, honey, nothing. Suffer no more, no, honey, nothing. I had a hold of that bed and I looked at that boy. He was about seven witnesses, my wife and this fellow and them and his wife. And I said, Lord, I come to you as humbly as I know how. Don't know how to pray, God. Don't know what to say, but you do. But would you help this fellow when it's time to cross over, be with his family? And all of a sudden I heard, Rrr! and he come up out of that bed and was right in my face and was growling at me and blood started shooting out of his his nose and mouth, and as he died, he's going, Rah! and then they asked me to do the funeral. There's a difference. My wife said apparently his aorta had ruptured and caused, he died by extenuation, the blood come out of him. And as he fell down, the look on his face in that bed was not one of, I'm going to bite you, Donnie. It was one of, I just seen where I'm headed. Brother Donnie, you tried to scare us? No, I'm trying to give you a little taste of reality. There is a difference. Where will you be? Five minutes after you die. The life's basket is just that. It's just a basket. You're gone by the time we get you. You're gone by the time we embalm you. You're gone by the time we dress you up. You're gone because before we make you smell good and look good and, and be pretty. You're gone. And some of the things I've seen is just absolutely, I wouldn't share in a pulpit for no amount of money. Funeral directors die. A few weeks ago, we had one of our, a few months ago, we had one of our directors working a funeral. He looked at the lady that was an embalmer there and he is an embalmer and he sat down in a chair. The funeral's going on. He said, I feel bad and he died right there. We had a lady come to visit her sister and she died in the funeral home. We all are gonna leave here. I said, we're all gonna leave here. I'm gonna live forever. Just ain't gonna live forever in Johnson City or Moon Vista, amen. Well, number three, the contrast 
in eternity. Look at verse 23 again. And hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. There's a whole thing about, you could say there about why he was relaxing. He was a banquet. But let me go on. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. He may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Oh, the contrast in eternity. I seen one time on a gravestone it was said, Paul stranger, as you pass by, as you are now, once was I. As I am now, soon you will be. Come on, stranger, follow me. Some old fella took a marker and wrote down below it to follow you. I'm not content till I find out which way you went. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to tell you something else. Death's a great equalizer. A great get death is a good divide. I'm telling you, Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something else. There ain't no atheists five minutes after you die. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Why do I believe in hell? And I'll try to close. Because Jesus taught of it. Matthew 5 and 29 said, Thy right eye on the fendi, plug it out and cast it from before thee, for it is more profitable that all thy members should perish, that thy whole body should not be cast. Now, I know this thing's Jubilee message, guys, but I know God gave it to me. Secondly, the death of Jesus demonstrates it. My goodness, if you can't see how in the world people say, I don't believe a loving God. Let me tell you something. Somebody said last night, God is loving, and I'm telling you, we're in the age of grace. There's going to come a time he's going to judge, and God to this day despises sin. I don't care how bad we are, he still hates sin. The only way I get through this life is the Holy Ghost and the blood of Jesus. I hate to hear these preachers get up and tell how good they are. Amen. I was at a camp meeting out in Missouri one time. They called on this. Ned had a little weak talking preacher, but man, he was a preaching little machine. And they had to keep turning him up and turning him up and directly had this old buffalo over there from Colorado. I, he's one of them people I'd like to bought him for what he's worth and sold him for what he thought he's worth. He'd played football at UL, UCLA or somewhere. He'd come up on the stage like, yeah, turn this microphone down. You got a man up here now, not a boy. I said, man, my bladder is killing me, and I went to the bathroom. <laughs> and when I got to the bathroom, I went back to the motel, or the barracks, wherever we stay in our camp meeting. Guys, I can't find anywhere in this book that we can get arrogant. You see, Gary knows me, Larry knows me, Mike, but I know me. I know me, I know what I'm capable of. I ain't talking about just being lost. I know what I'm capable of since I've been saved. You know what you're capable of too, amen? Amen. But thirdly, the justice of God demands it. Justice of God demands it. And then he goes on to tell, I'm not going to get into everything, but Matthew 25 and 41 says, Then shall they on say unto him on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It's a place of eternal misery. It's a place of spiritual misery. It's a place of loneliness like I've never seen. Let me read you some more of that poem, and I'm trying to hush, Gary. I told, I told you I wouldn't go over 30 minutes, Lord's will. Mated for a with my chosen throne, long is eternity, oh, so long. Then woe is me if my soul is wrong. Five minutes. After I die, where will you be when your body's put in your last basket? Oh, what a fool, hard, but the word is true. Passing the Savior with death in full view. Doing a deed I can never undo. Five minutes after I die. If I'm flinging a fortune away, if I'm wasting salvation's day, just is the sentence that I've received, my soul shall say, Five minutes after I die. There's the way to stay away from hell, but there's no way to get out. No way to get out. Be saved, and you can say this five minutes after you die. Thanks be to Jesus for pardon free. He paid my debt 
on Calvary's tree. Paradise gates will unfold for me five minutes after I die. Oh, marvelous Jack, how marvelous is the grace that rescued me. Oh, joyous the moment that I finally, Jesus, I see. Oh, happy day, happy day will I be when I'm like he. Five minutes after I die. Randy and I have both helped pastors for uh, revivals for Pastor Randy Gillum at the First Baptist Church of White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. You come up to Scotch Forest. Brother Art come up a couple of nights and backed us up there. Brother Randy, uh, the flood had hit White Sulphur Springs a few years ago. Jerry's church gave thousands of dollars, as did ours. And I want to say this. I don't know how you feel about this person, but I'm just going to throw this out for you. Don't, I'm not trying to try to get you money or whatever, but if you want to, I've heard people talk about big-time ministries. Uh, my brother Randy told me before Red Cross got there and before the National Guard got there, the National Guard, Samaritan's Purse was there with three tractor and trailers and two van loads of preachers. I don't like Franklin Graham. I don't like lima beans, but I'll eat them. Amen. Oh, uh, I'll never forget old uh, J- uh, Marcel Ledbetter said, Uncle Versi sold old, old uh, Lawyer John a coon dog. And said, Lawyer John called and said, Uncle Versi, you've sold me a defective dog. He said, what do you mean? He said, you said to feed him old Roy. He said, yes, sir, that's what I've been feeding my dogs for 30 years. He said, it's been five days and he won't eat old Roy. He said, mine didn't eat it for two weeks. <laughs> but Randy finally got a hold of us, Gary. Gary called me and said, Randy's phone's working. And that flood come through there. They said that water was doing 70 miles an hour and it come off that mountain. And Randy's wife, I've done forgot her name. I had it. Della. Randy's wife, Della, had a brother that moved up there, and I don't know if y'all know about this or not, but Della called her brother and said, hey, they're calling for flash floods. Get out there. You're away from a creek. And her brother went over and looked, and he said, well, Della, he said, the creek ain't even up out of his banks. Four minutes later, yeah. and they know that because of the phone, four minutes later, the house shook, washed it off its foundation, and it turned sideways and started down the river. Her brother didn't know that, but her brother was an electrician, got a big cord and tied it around him, got his wife, his seven-year-old brother, our boy, and his 14-year-old daughter, Michaela Phillips. Let me go back three or four weeks before that. Michaela just got saved and sat on the second row at Revival, and he had her get up and give a testimony. Oh, God's timing, boys. Ain't it wonderful what God lets us hear and see? I've seen some awful stuff, but ain't you seen some good stuff? And that little old 14-year-old got up shaking and said, Uncle Randy is going to baptize me here pretty soon. God gloriously saved me two weeks ago. And they was wading across that water. And just as they got to the end of it, the electric cord broke on little Michaela's waist. And her daddy said he'd lay in bed for weeks and hear her say, Daddy, save me. And he grabbed the end of her fingers and she floated down the stream and they didn't find her for almost three weeks. Almost three weeks. And little Michaela died. But I got some good news for you. Evidently she had been witnessing to the high school there. (laughs) And at her funeral, many youngins and children for the first time in their life, they faced death. She had just been with some of her friends that evening. And now, where was Michaela five minutes after she died? I'm telling you, when she went under that water and that raging flood, the next thing she knowed, she opened her eyes and she was arrested. Jesus was a cradle. Hey, baby, welcome home. Welcome home. My question is tonight, where will you be five minutes after you die? I'm not here to, and I want to challenge you something I love about all these boys 
Guys, we get too hung up sometimes on everybody don't believe just like we do. You ought to have a little patience, and for God's sakes, don't talk ugly about people. Sometimes people, it takes, it takes me a little longer to catch on. It does others. My daddy would whoop me, and then he'd catch me doing something. He'd be taking that bell off. He'd go, you're a slow learner, boy. <laughs> but I improved over the years. Where? Five minutes after you die. When your family's going by saying, don't you look good? And don't he look natural? I've never seen nobody in a casket look natural. I knew my daddy his whole life. I never seen him go. <laughs> never did. And here's my favorite one they say, a little humor to end with. Gosh, Larry looked just like himself. And I'm standing there in my suit being all dignified. I thought, who'd you think is going to be, Batman? I mean, <laughs> we picked him up and we had the toe tag. We got the right guy. <laughs> That's him. <laughs> I can't tell you much, but I know we went over to the hospital and got him. It's a toes on. Said Larry Montgomery. <laughs> I'm glad that if I fall dead before I leave here tonight, I'll be at rest and home with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm thrilled to death that he's allowed me to be part of the body of Christ. Let me give you three things that you folks, probably most of you, if you've been in this church your whole life, you don't understand. One of the reasons I get so happy. Number one, God saved me in September the 12th, 1975. And he saved me in my mind 153 times over the next 15 years. Every time I'd get mad, every time I'd cuss, every time I'd do something, I'd get saved again. Baptized me four times and couldn't wash the sin away. <laughs> and then one day I found out that I was saved for eternity. And it's like being saved all over again. And then about five years ago I realized when I was saved. And you said it last night. Daddy took mama. God took care of mama and daddy. He took to her grandma. And you know both my grandpas was brawling, bootleggers, cut and shoot and go on. But God and his plan, and his sovereign plan, no, there's a little old short, gray-haired, crazy preacher that was going to be able to tell hundreds about Jesus and be here. I'm grateful. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Five minutes after you die, it's not going to take that long. It's not going to take that long. No, dear friend. Listen, if you're here tonight, you don't know the whereabouts of your soul after yes. you die. Tonight be a night to get that thing right with yes. God. Yes, yes. Tonight be a night for you to earnestly consider the condition of your heart. Yes. Is thine heart right with God? Yes. I want to say tonight, if it's not, we'd love for you to come to Christ. Jesus said on the last day of the feast, today, if you're thirsty, come get you some water. Yeah. I want to say tonight, if you feel yourself to be lost and without God, yes. if you feel yourself to be in need of salvation, there's a Christ that will save you. Yes. Yes. He'll save you. He is the only Savior. The only Savior. And I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about uh, whether you're of this branch or that branch or the other branch, I'm concerned as to whether or not your heart's right with God. Yes.